So uh, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Mike Kaufman, uh, and I'm a software engineer at Microsoft. I work on the Chakra JavaScript engine team. Uh, and over the last year or so, I've been working with a colleague of mine, Mark Marin, who's down here. Uh, and I've been working with the uh, Node.js Diagnostics Working Group and thinking about this problem of asynchronous context uh, and trying to get to some level of uh, conceptualization or formalization about this problem. Uh, and we believe that this is a problem that's foundational to JavaScript programming, uh, that it's applicable across the stack from the VM up or from the spec up even. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk to you about today. Um, so uh, quick agenda, we'll do a definition of what is async context, try and give people some intuition about that, uh, tell you why that's important, talk about some existing solutions uh, to the problem um, that have been done in the, in the JavaScript community to date, uh, and poke some holes in those existing solutions, and then talk about a formalization or a model that we think addresses some of those shortcomings. Um, we'll go through a few problems, how this model can be applied to solve some of these problems, and we'll talk about next steps and how we move this forward. So uh, what is asynchronous context, right? It's really the ability to answer the question, how did I get here across asynchronous boundaries? Um, and if you think about this synchronously, you always have a call stack available, and you can look at your call stack. Uh, you folks are probably familiar with asynchronous call stacks, or sometimes called long call stacks. Um, but this isn't just about you know, giving a programmer a set of call stacks. This is foundational. It's a fundamental thing. You want to be able to do it dynamically at runtime. Um, so you know, to sort of fill out your intuition, here's uh, some example code. Um, this is some request app. Uh, the request app is uh, processing HTTP uh, requests. Um, there's function A. Uh, function A is a callback, an HTTP request comes in. Function A gets executed. Uh, it calls db.query, and it passes in a callback function B. Uh, and when function B gets invoked, it calls gen page and passes in a callback function C. Um, and so if you were to think about this intuitively and you were to start to draw a little picture of you know, this, the relationship between A, B, and C, you might draw something like this. And so uh, here we say, you know, C was sort of uh, scheduled by B, so you draw an arrow from C to B, and B was scheduled or enqueued by A, so you draw an arrow there. Um, but these aren't functions, right? These are invocations of functions, right? Um, so perhaps you've got two requests that have come in. And so you have uh, request one in blue and request uh, two in purple, right? And so these are distinct. If you're in the invocation of function C uh, and you want to know how did I get here, you want to walk this path of asynchronous functions associated with request, uh, or sorry, if you're in request one and you want to know how did I get here, you want to walk this path of asynchronous functions associated with request one, you don't want that intermingled with request two. If you think about how JavaScript works, there's an event loop uh, model. Functions get executed serially. Uh, perhaps request one and request two came in and, and were executed at the same time. Um, and they were interleaved. Uh, in this case, perhaps request one started first, but it finished last. And fundamentally, what we need to do to solve this problem is we need some pointers that point back across this execution chain, right? In this case, the solid line's for request one, the dotted line is for uh, request two. Um, and so that's what we're gonna talk about. Um, we're gonna give you some, uh, some concrete data structures that allow you to answer this question. Um, <clears throat> why is this an important question to answer? Well, it's really foundational to JavaScript's programming model, right? This, this notion of callback-driven programming is foundational, but there's a few problems. Uh, first off, there's no shared terminology, uh, and the concepts aren't clearly defined, right? So if you think about it with multi-threaded programming, we have uh, a set of concepts that we can reason about. There's critical sections, there's mutexes, there's semaphores. Two people can have a high-level conversation about multi-threaded program behavior, 
but we don't necessarily have those same concepts and nomenclature for this callback model, right? This asynchronous callback model. <clears throat> There's no tie-in to JavaScript source code, uh, which means that somebody reading code has to have an understanding of the APIs and understand where these asynchronous boundaries are at the API level. And there's no syntactic tie-ins uh, in the code that they're writing that gives them, uh, that gives the reader of the code further understanding of where these asynchronous boundaries are. Uh, there's no formal specification. So depending on where you are working uh, in the stack, um, you may make some assumptions or try and solve this problem and then get broken uh, by somebody below you in the stack. And so there's a recent example. Uh, there's a, a solution inside of uh, Node.js today. Uh, and uh, they are doing some stuff. And there was a recent optimization in V8 that broke what was happening up the stack. So why is it, this ability to answer how did I get here uh, important? It's also important in applications and tooling. Uh, there's a number of things here. I won't go through all of them. Um, a continuation local storage is one. Uh, in that case, you want some ambient key value lookup analogous to thread local storage. That is, you want to be able to, to say, get me some value that's associated with my request one, and you want to find that value associated with request one. Uh, there's another thing I'll call out here uh, we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, memory leak detection. Uh, and uh, this is just kind of a motivating example uh, for why this is something that's foundational and should be available across uh, the entire stack. So <clears throat> uh, this, the, the importance is sort of uh, evidenced by the JavaScript community taking multiple attempts to f address this. Monkey patching is frequently used. That's where you go and, and overwrite some function in an API and sort of intercept the parameters and try and, and track the necessary information you need. It works great until it doesn't. Um, and it doesn't work when those APIs change uh, or when you need to monkey patch something that is implemented at, at the VM level, right? So async await native promises, uh, those things can't be monkey patched. Uh, domains. Uh, is a deprecated API inside of Node that tried to solve this problem. Uh, there's a postmortem online, so you can go uh, read about the various drawbacks and why it was deprecated. I'll call out two here. One is it conflated this notion of um, asynchronous structure with asynchronous exception handling, and I think that was problematic. Uh, and the other uh, problem here is that it required explicit enter-leave semantics. So you could enter a domain, and if you had a code path that didn't correctly leave the domain, you were broken. So async hooks is the current implementation inside of Node. Async hooks is effectively a bunch of lifecycle events around low-level resources inside of Node. Uh, there's a few drawbacks to, to async hooks. Um, one is, is these resource events are low-level things, and those get exposed to whoever it is that's consuming the event. So you're basically exposing implementation details uh, to, to the listener. Uh, it's also expensive. It's making a bunch of transitions from native code into JavaScript code, and those are expensive. Uh, and there's no corollary to the browser or, or any other hosts. Um, there's some academic investigations. I cite two here uh, just to, to let you know that smart people are thinking about this problem. Um, <clears throat> so a formal model, what does a formal model look like? Well, what we want to do is we want to define the concepts of asynchronous code execution and give names to those concepts. Right? That would be a, a, a step in the right direction. We want to provide explicit structure, that is, clear data structures that people can reason about uh, and people can have conversations about. We don't want to do any policy, right? We want to give people some data structures, and then people can argue about what the right policy is. For example, if you wanted to do exception propagation across asynchronous boundaries, people can use this data structure and effectively talk about, uh, talk about that. And lastly, we're looking at this as how do you implement it across the full stack starting at the VM level. Uh, and there's uh, multiple reasons for that. Uh, you know, one is a potential for syntactic constructs. You can reinforce programmer understanding. Uh, you can eliminate these expensive callbacks. Uh, and you will have first class support for asynchronous context as the language evolves. So um, let's talk about the concepts. I want to 
ground people with sort of what a JavaScript application looks like. Um, at the basic level, you've got some host, for example, Node.js or the browser. The host is going to embed a JavaScript VM. And on top of that, you're going to have uh, some JavaScript code. And this is either modules that you downloaded through NPM or something that the user is typing. These things communicate through some APIs. Sometimes these APIs are synchronous. Sometimes they're asynchronous. So what is an async API? Uh, it's really an API that, that takes a function as a parameter and that function is invoked asynchronously, right, at some point later in time. Our goal is to give some primitive constructs at the VM level uh, that lets us capture async code flow at the API boundary. So there's a few reasons for that, right? I say primitive constructs because primitive constructs are easy to reason about and they're easy to get correct. Right? And so when things are uh, incorrect, you can push it up the stack. So if you're at the VM level and you're like, hey, we're doing this thing the right way, the problem is in Node, then you can you know, bump the problem off of you if you work on a VM team. Um, the, uh, the other issue here uh, is you want to capture this stuff at the API boundaries, because that's where the programmer who's writing the code has their sort of understanding of, of what's happening. Right? That's where they're thinking about what their program is doing, is where they're writing code against those APIs. Right? So <clears throat> the concepts, and there's two concepts um, that we'll define here. Uh, the first one is what we'll call a continuation. And a continuation is a special type of function that's passed into one of these asynchronous API boundaries. Right? So you call set timeout, you pass in f, f is a continuation. And a continuation is special because when that thing is invoked, it's going to create something that we call a context. And a context is just a data structure that has that necessary linkage that allows us to answer the question, how did we get here? So <clears throat> there's a couple of, uh, there, there's one assumption and one invariant, and I'll drill into these. One assumption is all functions passed across these API boundaries, these async API boundaries, uh, are continuations. Right? And we'll talk a little bit more about how you can go th and enforce that assumption or ease that, that assumption into reality. Um, and there's an invariant. And the invariant is all JavaScript code executes inside of a context. And we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. So this assumption, let's drill in. There's an API, and we're going to call it continuify. And what continuify does is it says, given a function f, if f is already a continuation, return f. Otherwise, transform it into a continuation. So why is this useful? Well, what you can do is you can go into these asynchronous API boundaries at the host level or in user libraries or at the VM level, and every parameter that you know is a function, you need to continuify it. And this has a few benefits, right? One is callers of this API don't need to uh, do anything to, to follow this model, right? And there's some TypeScript there that uh, sort of just to exam uh, exemplify what uh, the, the signature of continuify is. Um, <clears throat> this invariant, all JavaScript code executes inside of a context. So let's uh, look at an example, and then I'll sort of explain this in more detail. So we've got set timeout. We pass in a continuation x. x calls y and y calls z. Uh, y and z are just functions. Um, so at some point, your call stack is going to look like this, right? Uh, and you'll notice that this special call stack where x is, is is a special call stack because it's a special function, right? And <clears throat> what this lets us do is it lets us say for any given stack frame, we can find what our context is by looking down the stack, right? This invariant that all code is Executing in a context implies specifically that there's a continuation frame on the stack at all times. So then if you have a given frame, you can look down, you can find your continuation, right? And your continuation is going to have a pointer to a context. And again, this is TypeScript just to sort of give examples of what the shape of these APIs are. Uh, your context has an invocation ID, right? This is a unique invocation of a function. It's unique across the entire lifetime of the process. Um, it has a pointer back to the continuation that created it. Um, and uh, there's a couple of other properties here. Uh, one is that we call this thing, a ready, this thing we call a ready context. 
right, which is effectively a pointer across promise chains. And the other thing is this thing that we call a link context, which is a pointer to where a continuation was created, the context where a continuation was created, right? Anytime you construct a continuation by the invariant, you always have a, 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 a context, uh, and you can link those things. So given all of this data, we can then traverse wherever we are, we can always say, you know, how did I get here? And you can traverse uh, either this, this ready context edge or the link context edge. So we'll walk through an example. Uh, we've got foo.js, it's some file, it's gonna get loaded by a module loader. Uh, <clears throat> we've got function x, which does nothing. Uh, F2 calls x, F1 calls promise.resolve.then.then, passing in F2 twice, right? So F2 is a single continuation, it's gonna be invoked two times, that's two unique invocations of that, two unique contexts. And this thing loads, it calls F1 and kicks this stuff off. If you were to look at it on a timeline, uh, sorry, that's so small. Um, you'd see require of, of foo. Uh, that would be your first context. It would resolve that first promise, which would trigger the first invocation of F2, which would resolve another promise, which would uh, trigger the, the second invocation of F2, right? Now, <clears throat> we said that these, each context has a pointer back to the, the continuation where it was uh, where it was uh, the continuation that was invoked to create the context. And so we've got some uh, continuation here for require, and we've got some continuation here for F2, and we've got some linkage that points back that way. We said we have a pointer from each continuation to the context where it was created. So F2 is a continuation, and it points to require. Uh, and there's some root continuation, so hand waving over this thing for require a little bit. And we said we've got pointers across this, the promise chain, right? So that is when, when context three is executing, uh, it's gonna point back to context two because that was the previous promise and the chain was resolved, right? Um, and likewise, context two is gonna point back to context one, right? So there's a bunch of lines here. If you look at it a different way, it looks like this, which is a more natural tree type structure. Um, and uh, this is a graph. Right? You notice it's, it's directed, the edges all point up, and this has a nice property that contexts and continuations are just JavaScript objects and they, be, they can be collected uh, by the garbage collector. So at any given node in this graph, you can always walk the path to the root. If you need to walk from the root down or you wanna start examining subtrees or constructing subtrees, you need to transpose the graph. That's a well understood operation. Uh, and so that graph can be transposed uh, at runtime if needed. Um, and transposing is just changing the directionality of all of those edges. Um, <clears throat> we call this the async call graph. Um, and it's a DAG, I think I said all of this stuff already. Uh, yeah, the nodes are specifically the continuations and context, and then there's three forms of edges here. Um, <clears throat> so, So getting into some, some solutions or how this can be applied, um, and you see some of this stuff today, I think BubbleProf does this to some extent, um, relying on, on the structure inferred from async hooks. Um, but that doesn't necessarily work in the browser or in another host, right? Um, but you effectively have some HTTP request and you wanna know what was the sum of execution times across all you know, asynchronous function invocations inside of a request? Right? And you wanna be able to compute that. And maybe it's just a linear chain, like in this example from the first slide. Maybe it's a more complex tree structure, but you're able to start computing those times. Right? Uh, you can start sort of analyzing these things and look at you know, what happened with the request that was in the 99th percentile. Right? That's an interesting problem or an interesting thing to be able to answer when you're running at scale. So uh, memory leak detection is kind of an interesting thing, and this is a sort of an example that motivates why this is something that's foundational and necessary across the entire stack from the VM up. The idea here is that every heap alloc that you're gonna do inside of the VM, every allocation on the JavaScript heap is gonna get tagged with a context. Now it's an expensive operation, it's not something you'd wanna do all the time, uh, but it's, it's interesting in some cases. If you wanna track down memory leaks, you can apply heuristics to your heap where objects were allocated, 
and you can identify weird patterns, right? So one weird pattern might be that you have an array that references things from multiple subtrees in, in your context graph, right, your async call graph, or references objects that were allocated in these things. So you could say, I have an array, and I can reference things allocated in request one and reference things allocated in request two. It's potentially a problematic pattern. Uh, another one is you have, uh, for example, uh, the second picture here, you've got uh, an object that was allocated in the context of request one that's referenceable from request two. Right? So you can start walking over your, um, your JavaScript heap and applying these various heuristics and start highlighting uh, problems to the user that they may want to go off and investigate. So um, I don't know. I'm at 20 minutes. I did this this morning, and it was like 31. So I don't know. I'm talking really fast, or I'm missing something. Um, the, the next steps here, uh, you know, right now this is conceptual, right? Um, we've kind of been circling around this problem, uh, trying to find the right path through it, the right way to frame it, the right way to, to have a conversation with people about what are these concepts and how do they work. And so we're really interested in feedback uh, that anybody ha may have, right? And this is a complicated problem, right? It's, uh, there's not a solution. There's been multiple attempts. Um, and so uh, we're really interested in in you know, the JavaScript programmer community being able to understand this and get it, right? So if you have feedback on it, let us know. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about opportunities to do that in a second. Uh, we need to get to an implementation. So I think that you know, we don't believe it's a lot of code to write um, at the moment. Uh, I think it's just finding the time. Um, to do that, uh, we need to understand what the effort would look like if you were to go through and continuify all of these async APIs inside of Node. And we want to understand the perf, right? I think people are very sensitive to performance. I think when we talk about it and we sketch some, some things out, it's like, you know, an allocation here and, you know, five instructions there, big deal. Um, but, uh, I think we, we need to be able to measure that and communicate what the overhead is when this is on. Um, lastly, there's the opportunity here for spec integration. That is, go to TC39 um, and start having a, a broader conversation about this uh, and how this gets enforced at the spec. This does multiple things. It in ensures that you know, promises are um, first class citizens with this concept. It ensures that this stuff doesn't get broken as the language evolves. It ensures that async await is, it can implement this model in a way that's reasonable and sound to the, the reader of the code. Um, and there's just some things here listed about where inside of the spec we would need to go in and start updating some text. Um, so, uh, and lastly, syntactic support. You could imagine there's a keyword called a continuation that would reinforce people's understanding of where they're, they're constructing functions that are going to establish these contexts which impact the sort of logical async uh, call flow. Um, <clears throat> so thank you. Uh, you know, if you've got feedback, we're really interested in, hear it, uh, in hearing it. We'll be here to answer a few questions after. Uh, I'll be at the Microsoft booth on the booth floor uh, today and tomorrow, um, and we'll be at Collaborator Summit. Uh, my email's up here. Mark's email is up here. Uh, you can get involved in the Node.js Diagnostics Working Group. We meet biweekly, um, and uh, you know we're always happy to have people uh, get involved there. And this is a topic that has come up for discussion uh, various times. Uh, and then the Diagnostics Working Group is having a breakout on Friday at 3.30, and we've got a slot scheduled to do a deep dive into this then. So, uh, and I expect that's going to be more of a two-way conversation than me just talking at people. Um, and so uh, hopefully, uh, if you're interested in the topic or you think it's a great idea or you think it's a crazy idea uh, and it'll never work, then you know, come and tell us because we want to hear, we want to have that conversation. So um, thank you.